My name is Dr. Seth M. Porter, and I'm the Dean of the Kramer Family Library and Academic Online Lead at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Today, I'm going to be discussing with my colleague, Dr. Ilahavi Tuawani, the Assistant Professor of Native American Indigenous Studies, as well as the inaugural Kramer Family Library Storytelling Professor, our attempts to decolonize academic research libraries collections and programming through, through storytelling and digital preservation and celebration. The plan for today is to discuss the vision and foundation of this, the process and implementation and how we're using storytelling to attempt to decolonize, decolonize information archives as well as the content overall at academic research libraries. So what does this actually look like? Overall the goal was to create, celebrate, preserve, and change as well as recenter live narratives and re-indigenize the collection as well as the academic research library at KFL and hopefully to diffuse this type of programming and efforts to other academic research libraries within the country. So one of the main goals here was to, to create a continuous process of decolonization within our content. And so how do we actually do this? Number one, I want to start this conversation with uh, kind of just a, a quick note that decolonization as well as decolonizing information and knowledge doesn't belong to me. It is vital to me. It's something I care deeply about in libraries. And I, But the goal for me was to center and emphasize the folks who can do the work, who knows the work, and make sure they have the financial resources to do it. So it's really for me personally about recentering others who this is core to who they are and making sure this content as well as this important work is done uh, by the folks who quite frankly know what the hell they're doing. And my goal was to always just help create the framework and then hand it off to the best people. And that's what we're doing. So the vision started kind of with a cooperative discussion with multiple stakeholders on campus, uh, indigenous communities, and start looking into the literature. And from there, uh, I personally took a lot of time working with our one of our major donors to rework as well as uh, get access to more funds so we could actually do this important work. So it kind of went from vision to donor management to fundraising development and relationship management across the board. Once we were able to create what the vision looks like, what we want, we didn't want it to be just paint by numbers and say, this is what you're doing. The goal here was to create an overall goal, uh, have a compass and have the right people create the roadmap for us on how we're actually going to do this. And so once once we were able to audit and work on our endowment processes, make sure we had the funds available, loosen it up so this could happen, we started also doing more fundraising across the board to have a better collection, be able to endow this position across the board and make sure it's a commitment from the institution moving forward. So following that, we had we created policy and procedures around, okay, how does this look? How, how is it gonna work within the institution? Working with the School of Liberal Arts, on campus as well as the library to partner on this process to make sure it was kind of network managed across the board. So from there, we were able to endow the position and we started recruiting. Luckily, we had uh, a world-class expert and somebody, Dr. Ilahave Tuwani, who is exactly who we needed to do this important work. And she graciously accepted this and we're handing it off from there. So we recruited, we went from there, we had hiring and support. And then from there, me personally, I got the hell, hell out of the way and handed it to the experts to do this important, valuable work. And so one of the big terms that and one of the big ideas we wanted to get here, and this is kind of how I think about it as a continuous loop and how I think academic research libraries should, and academic research libraries should think about it. So the, the deans, uh, AULs, associate deans, I don't think unless you're a domain expert, you have the experience, you've lived it, you've studied this your, your entire life and it's part of core to who you are and how you've lived, should be doing the work. I think, and this is what we're doing here, is we're allocating substantial financial resources to the domain experts, the, the major stakeholders and the people who've actually lived this to do the work and create the framework themselves. So that's what we did, number one. Second, we wanted to make sure we center and celebrate these domain experts, their lived experiences, their narratives and perspectives to make sure that we are recentering and re-indigenizing our collections as well as our programming from their experiences. They're the people who are leading this. They're doing the work. We're just as an academic research library and the leadership, the office of the dean, are trying to create the infrastructure with them, co-create the infrastructure to make sure we can implement this and there's long-term programming and processes around it. Next, again, we just allocate financial resources on relevant, uh, relevant resources to buy 
BIPOC and LGBTQI plus as uh, bookstores and vendors. So what we're what we're doing in addition to the storytelling programming is not only are we saying, okay, we want to make sure we're celebrating this type of content, whether it's electronic resources, digital artifacts, uh, anything in our IR archives, we're almost, we're trying to say, okay, not only are we doing that, we wanna make sure we're going to the right vendors. So we're really emphasizing in our collection development, focusing on uh, privately owned bookstores uh, and privately owned vendors that are part of the community. And so this is a big part of what we're doing. It takes extra work and acquisitions, but we're not just giving this money to Wiley or Amazon and you know they're, they're rebringing it back into their, the huge conglomerates that they are. No, we're trying to not only celebrate this locally, but make sure it's a pipeline to the people who are doing the work so it's a continuous feedback process. Next, we just are creating badass programming around this. And when we say me, I mean Dr. Lahave and the DEI committee. And so mostly I'm just hyping it and making sure that we really have an opportunity to do some uh, high impact programming. So last, we are everything we're creating, whether it's storytelling contests, bringing in local indigenous storytellers, we are going to create digital preservation and exhibi exhibitions around this, whether it's story maps, uh, everything across the board, streaming, making sure this is preserved as well celebrated and accessible uh, to the world at large. And so number one, what is our collection strategy around this? We are deliberately creating, and I'm going to I'm going to have Ilahaba talk about some of this here in a minute. And we are going to preserve, and we're going to celebrate. So this is a use of ArcGIS and story maps, everything across the board, to make sure that this content is visually appealing, but it's also preserved for the long run. And so, what does this look like in in action? And uh, so why do we tell stories, right? We want to impart knowledge to relate to others and make someone laugh, share a memorable moment and make the moment memorable to the others. And so often in the past, the vast majority of academic research libraries have been uh, Western data, Western uh, American and European knowledge centers and ways of interacting with information. And the way we feel about it is, we think while that needs to be part of our collection, we need to recenter and celebrate these lost narratives and make it part of a continual improvement process. So for example, I'm gonna stop here and let uh, Dr. Ilahabe tell an interesting story on how we do this, how we're doing it, and how we wanna do this moving Everyone forward. Everyone gather around. I've got a story to tell you. I'm Eli Havlatul Orne, and I'm the inaugural Kramer Family Library Storytelling Professor at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And I've got a story to tell you. Uh, this is a story that illustrates the value of oral storytelling. Um, heaps and heaps of ages ago, in my father's islands, the islands of Toma, uh, they tell a story. Uh, two, two little, little children, children to help feed their families. But this story, um, it's, it stars an octopus, the feke, they call it, uh, and a little rat. This rat, uh, his ship was sinking. It was in the middle of the ocean. He could see Vava'u, an island far, far in the distance, but he knew that he'd never be able to reach it, not with his little tiny rat legs. He's drowning, and suddenly a feke rises out of the ocean and uh, brings the rat to the surface and uh, makes a deal with the rat. The rat says, if you take me to Vava'u, I'll pay you when we get to the shore. Well, him being a rat, he knew he had no payment, not really. So um, he gets closer to the shore, he sees the shore, he knows that he'll be able to make it, and uh, as a rat, he leaves a little something on the octopus's head just as he swam off to shore. A little number two right on the octopus's head. In fact, that is how the uh, octopus gets its inky spots right on, the head, on his head. And uh, the octopus uh, feels his, these, these, uh, the uh, number two that the, uh, the rat uh, left him and says, yells at him in the distance, my kind will hunt your kind for the rest of eternity. And in fact, the octopus still does. Right here, what we have is a, a maka feke, an octopus lure, shaped like a rat. Anyone, any child could dangle this rat in front of the reef 
in the in 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 the reef and the octopus will leave the safety of its reef home and wrap itself around this makafeke and uh not let go even when it's pulled out of the ocean the person can just whack the whack the octopus in there you fed your family this is the value of oral storytelling the child now knows why the feke hates the rat, the feke kills the rat, but also the child, and in fact now you, know how to catch a rock, an octopus. This story is now in you. You have this story. If ever you are lost again, again, if you ever you are lost, trapped, marooned on a island, you can make a maka feke, stone, shell, twine, rope, little tail, and feed yourself. There is no empirical European knowledge that tells us why the feke hates the rat. It's only this story. This is the value of oral storytelling. When everything burns down, when the libraries burn, when uh, the uh, uh, the central database, you know, um, gets ruined by a flood, what else? How else are we going to impart our knowledge? Thank you for joining. I hope you never forget the story of the Makafeke. That is just one example of the type of storytelling program we're trying to do. And what Dr. Lahava is doing across UCCS and for the Kramer Family Library is diffusing this type of uh, re-indigenization and centering different forms of knowledge within the library. And what we as the Kramer Family Library are trying to do is celebrate the work that she's doing and others that like her are doing and, and making sure we're preserving it for generations to come. And this is a big goal of ours here at the U University of Colorado, Colorado Springs and the Kramer oh, Family God. Library. And so what have we actually been doing? So there's a few things. Number one, we every year have the PER Storytelling Hour, and this is an opportunity where we teach students and community members to tell stories. We will, in the future, as of next year, and as we move forward in the spring, we'll be, we'll be live streaming this, having all digital content, as well as preserving the content moving forward for future generations. In addition to that, we will be located, we will be having an annual Heller Center Local Storytelling Fellow. So the, the Heller Center is a local humanities center on the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs campus. It's in the Bluffs. It's a beautiful location, Santa Fe architecture. And so we'll be bringing in a local storyteller, most likely from the Oop Mountain Oop, and we'll be setting them up as an artist in residency for a week, coming out of the uh, University of Colorado Springs uh, Kramer Family Library Endowment and paying for them, uh, as well as a substantial stipend to live and create and we'll be preserving this content. In addition to that, they'll have a, a fireside chat where at the end of their their end of, the end of their fellowship, they'll actually have an opportunity to have uh, the, to create stories and have people around an actual fireside. And we'll be making sure we're documenting all this content for future generations. And we'll be doing that uh, year in year out. Uh, moreover, we'll we'll be starting to collect student storytelling exhibits, story maps, and oral histories. So we want to make sure we are. Uh, preserving a lot of the local uh, Oot Mount Oot and as well as Navajo uh, stories from our greater community and preserving these moving forward, whether it's a story map or oral storytelling across the board. Uh, moreover, we'll be having library scavenging hunts and reimagining storytelling contests as we move forward. And so a lot of this content will be about stories, about decolonization of information, diffusing this into the community, the research, as well as the student, uh, the student lived experience. So, Dr. Elahave talks a lot about how we are decolonizing through collections. So it's, you know, when we think about this, a lot of what we talk about is what values do our collections in our archives as well as our general collection espouse? Uh, so what do we consider collectible? What objects go to the library archive or museum archive? Who decides what is an artifact or a document? Whose voices are represented or muted because of this in an archive? And so a lot of this work, which Dr. Elahave has worked on, uh, is you know it, it's inspired by the ar uh, archival silences projects 
uh, that's coming out of Princeton University where I used to where I used to work. So a lot of this a lot of this work is inspired by that. And Dr. Hilahave actually worked on a lot of this process. So we're trying to say, what do we consider collectible? And we're trying to kind of flip that script and say, these stories, these narratives, this needs to be preserved and centered along with this, the previous forms of empirical knowledge. Uh, so the stories like Dr. Hilahave just mentioned, this is incredibly important to us. So <clears throat> the next steps for us, uh, we, we are just now hiring a digital curator, and so they're going to preserve all storytelling through video, digital learning objects, live streaming, uh, any, any of the digital artifacts. We are, in addition to that, going to create digital exhibitions and have an ongoing updated digital, uh, digital storytelling exhibition that is continually updated annually and going to be one of our prized uh, exhibitions physically as well as digitally. It's going to be uh, uh, something that we spend a lot of time, resources, and effort, and uh, Dr. Lahava and the new digital curator will be uh, focusing on those efforts. So the, the goal here is, again, a cons consistent feedback loop from creation to preservation and celebration. Uh, we want to make sure we have digital exhibitions, reflections of current programming, uh, video, online objects, oral histories, podcasts, all of it across the board. We're trying to create alignment with this type of effort and making sure it's not only preserved, but we use the term celebrated. It needs to be front and center across the board. And we also want to curate all relevant community acti activities and content. And again, number last, I keep saying it, but preserve and celebrate. So as we move forward, here's our contact information. We're always happy to talk about this either these efforts. Again, Dr. Seth Porter, Dean of the Library, you see my email there. Dr. Ilahave Tuwani, the real leader of this programming. Uh, if, if you want to get into the weeds on this, see what we can do. She is a person of contact. She is the point of the spear here. And uh, quite frankly, uh, it's been a real honor to work with her and learn from her. And it's changed how I think about library uh, research collections and how we build these moving forward. And she's been an inspiration. Uh, and it's changing the way we do work here at the Kramer Family Library. So thank you for this. Uh, it's been a pleasure to share this.